Last lecture, we considered the skeptical problem and Rene Descartes' attempt to find undoubtable truths, things that we can know even if we can't first know that our experience of the world is accurate. We saw Descartes' argument fail to ground our knowledge of the world's existence, but I suggested that we can still know the world exists because it provides the best explanation for our experiences. But even if we ignore all that and simply grant that the world exists, we're still left wondering, just how accurate is our knowledge of the world? Do our beliefs really reflect the way the world is? And what's the best way to go about making sure that they do? What's the best way to gain knowledge? To answer these questions, we need to explore the philosophy of empiricism. Now, Descartes was a rationalist. He thought some beliefs can be justified a priori, justified without or before having any sense experience. Conversely, the empiricist maintains that we can't know anything without sense experience. So not only is it the best way to gain knowledge, it is the only way. The first major empiricist was the British philosopher John Locke, who in his 1689 book, an essay concerning human understanding, suggested that we are born tabula rasa, as a blank slate. When we are born, our minds contain no ideas, and we only start to form ideas once we have sense experience. Now, by idea, Locke doesn't just mean a revelation, like, I have an idea, let's go get some Thai food. Although that would count as an idea, for Locke, an idea is anything in the mind beliefs, sensations, private thoughts, mental talking, etc. According to Locke, we get ideas in two different ways. By sensation, observing the world, and reflection, observing our own mental operations. The former generates simple ideas like heat and solidity, shape and taste. The latter generates ideas of perception, doubting and reasoning, we can combine these ideas to come up with new unique complex ideas, but we can't generate new simple ideas on our own. So ultimately everything in our mind, according to Locke, traces back to something we learned through our senses. So since knowledge is justified true belief and truth is correspondence with the world, if we want to know how accurate our knowledge is, we need to know whether the ideas in our minds correspond to the way the world is. To put it in Lockean terms, we want to know whether the idea in our minds resemble the properties or qualities in objects that produce those ideas. So, for example, my idea of solidity was produced by the first solid object I saw. Did the quality of solidity that that object had actually resemble the idea it produced in my mind? Now, it seems so. The object and my idea share the same property, solidity. Locke called such properties primary qualities and also included among them things like solidity, extension, figure, motion, rest, and number. These are all qualities that objects have regardless of whether they're being perceived, or even whether any minds exist to perceive them at all. But many qualities are secondary qualities. The ideas they produce are not like the quality itself. Take for example your idea of heat. Now you got it by touching a hot object. But what actually makes an object hot? Well, scientifically speaking, an object is hot when its molecules have high energy, when they're moving around and bouncing off each other at high velocity. The more movement and speed they have, the higher the object's temperature. When you touch in a hot object, that, object's is, that motion is transferred to you, to your skin, and nerves, which causes an electrical signal to be sent to your brain. Your brain processes that signal and poof, a sensation of heat emerges. Think about this. What does your sensation of heat feel like? What property does it have? Imagine it. 
Got that sensation in your head? Now ask yourself, does that property of that sensation in any way resemble molecular movement? Does it feel like movement at all? If it weren't for science, would you be able to tell just by touching that a hot object's molecules are moving faster? It seems not, because your idea of heat in no way resembles any quality a hot object has. The only thing that's really hot is your sensation, your idea. The object is not hot. It merely produces a hot sensation in your mind. Or consider color. We see an object as a color because certain wavelengths of light reflect off of it. When those wavelengths hit your eye, it causes your optic nerve to send a signal to your visual cortex, and ultimately you experience a visual sensation of color. But think about what your sensation of, say, red is like when you look at an apple. What properties does that sensation have? Does the wavelength of light have that property? No, it's just spread out or scrunched together in different frequencies. Does the apple itself have that property of color? No, the quality in the apple's skin that causes you to see that color has only to do with, roughly put, its molecules and the fact that its molecules have, that the molecules it has cause the object to absorb and reflect certain wavelengths of light. The only thing that actually has the property of redness is your sensation or idea of red. Nothing in the world is actually red. Nothing in the world is actually a color. Color only exists in your mind. And we could say the same thing about tastes and smells and sounds. None are qualities that objects have when they're not being perceived. They only exist in the mind. So, what does this tell us about the accuracy of our knowledge? Well, Locke would say our knowledge regarding the primary qualities of the world is quite accurate. Our ideas of those qualities resemble the actual qualities in the world themselves. An object we perceive as solid is solid. However, our knowledge regarding the secondary qualities of objects is not, op is not accurate. We think the world has color, heat, taste, and smell, but in fact, the world contains no such qualities. Only our minds do. So our knowledge of the world is inaccurate in that the world doesn't look anything like our experience of it. When I think of this, I can't help but think of Dressgate, that stupid online controversy in February of 2015 about whether or not that dress was blue and black or white and gold. Well, what's the right answer? It's neither. It's not any color at all. Color is a property had only by our experiences. And since the light waves, the picture of that dress produce are on the borderline, in some people they produce a black and blue experience, and in others they produce a white and gold experience. But it's not like there's some objective fact about what color the dress is. There are only facts about what wavelengths of light the dress reflects and how different people's brains interpret them. The vitriol that controversy produced in people could have been avoided if they would have simply realized that, at least when it comes to secondary qualities like color, we don't actually see the world as it really is. Unfortunately, science has actually banished many of Locke's primary qualities into the realm of secondary qualities. For example, consider his example of solidity. We perceive as solid some objects when in reality they are mostly empty space. In fact, all objects that are solid are mostly empty space. Even the atoms that make them up are mostly empty space. We call objects solid when they won't pass through each other, but solid objects don't pass through each other merely because of the way their atoms interact, but the atoms never actually touch. And if we factor in quantum mechanics, even the particles that make up atoms, like electrons and protons, they're not solid either. They are probabilistic wave functions that take on properties like location and velocity only when they are measured. And even then, they can only take on one such property at a time. So, things are not looking good if we think our knowledge of the world is accurate. 
But around 1740, another empiricist, David Hume, raised even deeper questions about the accuracy of our knowledge in his book, A Treatise of Human Nature. Hume divides the content of our minds into impressions and thoughts. An impression, which is very vivid, is a sensation that you are having right now. For example, you are having an impression of the sound of my voice. A thought is less vivid, like a memory of an impression. Although you are having an impression of my voice right now, as soon as I stop speaking, you will only have a thought, a memory of what it was like. Well, Hume says our ideas are related in three ways. Resemblance, contiguity, shared location in time and space, and cause and effect. If our ideas about two objects in the world resemble each other, then we think the objects in the world resemble each other. If the ideas in our mind are contiguous, close to each other in time and space, then we think the objects that produce those ideas are contiguous. And if we think our ideas are causally related, one causes the other, then we think the objects in the world that produce these ideas also share a causal relation. Now, Hume thinks our knowledge about the relationship between ideas can be accurate, the relationship. For example, I can know exactly how my idea of the number two relates to the idea number one. So, Hume thinks our knowledge of things like geometry and math is on pretty solid ground. But, our knowledge of matters of fact, our knowledge about the outside world, is quite subject to doubt. Hume says this is because our reasoning regarding matters of fact is founded largely on conclusions that we have drawn about the causal relationship between things in the world. We gain knowledge of matters of fact through cause and effect. And this seems right. To gain almost every piece of knowledge we have, we rely on some assumption regarding cause and effect. I, for example, think that my legs are causing me to stand upright and that the floor is causing me not to fall a few stories to my death, that my vocal cords are causing sounds to be produced, that this microphone is causing my voice to be recorded, and so on. But Hume argues our knowledge of causation and causal relationships between objects is on very shaky ground. To know that two things, let's say alpha and beta, are causally related we need to know that there is a necessary connection between them. That, in other words, in the future, every time alpha occurs, beta will immediately follow it. But we certainly aren't born with such knowledge. Hume's an empiricist, so he doesn't think we are born with any knowledge. And even if he's wrong about that, we definitely are not born with knowledge of a necessary connection between objects. Even something as simple as, when I slap my hands together, it makes a clapping sound, is learned by experience. And no amount of pre-effect observation can even let you know what that effect will be, much less that the effect will always follow the cause. For example, I could examine these two metallic egg-looking things as much as I want, but until I actually put them together, I will have no idea what sound they will actually make. Ultimately, we have no direct impression that leads to our idea of causation, our notion that two things are necessarily connected. Hume suggests we infer a causal relationship and thus conclude that when one occurs, the other one will always follow, when we observe events sharing the following properties. Continuity, uninterrupted connection, succession, or union. Priority and time, one happens right before the other. And constant conjunction, they always happen together. And it seems that he's right. When we continually see two events in uninterrupted succession, one right after the other, we infer a causal relationship between them. If beta has always happened right after alpha, then we conclude that beta will always happen right after alpha. In other words, that they are causally connected. But we only do this, Hume argues, because of habit or custom, not because of reason. So 
What we call a cause is not really a cause. It's just an event or object that is so tied in our imagination to another event that we cannot consider one without considering the other. And Hume thought this because meeting those criteria is not enough to guarantee a causal relationship. Take day and night, for example. They exhibit continuity, priority in time, and constant conjunction. Day has always immediately followed night. But day does not cause night, nor does night cause day. The clock on my dresser showing 11 o'clock p.m. is always conjoined with my being tired. But the clock does not cause me to be tired. Recall the causal fallacy we mentioned in a previous lecture. Correlation does not entail causation. It seems that all of our reasoning regarding causation is fallacious. It's based on that fallacy. Simply put, to have knowledge of causation, we would have to have knowledge of the future. To know that every time, past, present, and future, when alpha occurs, beta will occur. But of course, we can't see into the future. For all we know, the next time alpha occurs, beta won't occur. We can't know there is a necessary connection, and thus we cannot infer causation. Since knowledge of causation seems to be what most of our knowledge regarding the world is grounded upon, our ability to have knowledge of the world seems greatly diminished. To solve this problem, one might be tempted to employ some basic inductive reasoning. If I've always seen beta following alpha in the past, I can simply infer that it always will in the future. Fair enough. But Hume points out that, while it's true that you could use induction to derive that conclusion, to trust that conclusion, you would have to show that induction is reliable, that the conclusions of strong inductive arguments are usually true. All induction is based upon the presumption that the future will resemble the past, so you would have to show that that assumption is reliable in order to trust that conclusion. Now, we might be tempted to think that we can prove this. So let me give it a try. Every time I clap my hands, it made a sound. Therefore, I infer that the next time I do so, there will be a clapping sound. Success. The future resembled the past. Induction worked. Let's do it again. Good. Good. It worked. The future just resembled the past three times. Therefore, I infer that the future will always resemble the past. So, induction is reliable. Did you catch the error? Ultimately, what mistake did I make? What am I trying to prove? That induction is reliable. Yet, what kind of argument did I just give? An inductive argument. I'm assuming the future will resemble the past to conclude that the future will resemble the past. So I'm just begging the question or arguing in a circle. I'm simply assuming the truth of what I'm trying to prove. But it seems that there's no other way to prove that induction is reliable. So we simply have to assume that induction is reliable. We have to assume that the future will resemble the past. But if we assume it, it doesn't seem that we know it, because we can't justify a belief by merely assuming it. So we don't know that induction is reliable. And if we don't know that, we can't have knowledge of causation. And if we can't have that, we can have no meaningful knowledge of the world. This is what is known as Hume's problem of induction. And it's still considered unsolved by many philosophers. But there are a couple of ways of responding to the threat to our knowledge that empiricism poses. One such response lies in idealism, like the idealism of philosopher George Berkeley concerning the principles of human knowledge was published in 1710. In response to the suggestion that our idea of objects do not match up to their subjects, the material objects that the ideas are supposedly of, Berkeley suggests that our ideas are the subject. So all that really exists is ideas. That's why he was called an idealist. 
for he believed that to be is to be perceived. Barclay argues that when I perceive an object like a Rubik's cube, all I am perceiving is my own sensation, a cube-like structure with various colors on every side. But of course, the only thing that actually has that structure and those colors is my experience, my idea of the cube. So it must be that the cube is actually just my idea of it. As you can imagine, Berkeley's idealism is considered a hard philosophical pill to swallow. There are no material objects, there's only ideas. Well then where do the ideas come from? If to be is to be perceived, then things don't exist unless someone is looking at them. While I might believe that as an infant, can I really rationally believe that as an adult? To solve this problem or answer this objection, Berkeley interjects God as a necessary component of his theory. All things exist at all times because they're being perceived by God, and we have the ideas we do because God produces them in us. But if we're looking for a foundation of knowledge, Berkeley's philosophy is not going to serve us well. It relies on knowledge of God's existence, and that's going to be much harder to establish than knowledge of the world. Besides, by my estimation, if your theory is in trouble and the best you can do is say, uh, God did it, then you're basically admitting that the theory doesn't work. Another approach to resolve the problem posed by empiricism is that of the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. In his critique of pure reason, Kant essentially tried to find the middle ground between the rationalism of philosophers like Descartes and the empiricism of philosophers like Hume and Locke. His is a kind of synthesis of the two theories that recognizes the strengths and weaknesses of both. For example, Hume divides our knowledge into, into knowledge of relationships between ideas and matters of fact, a division that rationalism agrees with. For Hume, the former includes the relationships between ideas that we find in mathematics and geometry, like the Pythagorean theorem, and things that are true by definition, like all bachelors are unmarried. It is here that we can find things that are necessarily true, that are called analytic. On the other hand, matters of fact or knowledge of the world are things we learn by experience, things like all dogs bark. For Hume, these are called synthetic, and all synthetic truths are contingent. They are true, but they could possibly be false. Kant, however, argues that Hume failed to recognize the possibility of synthetic a priori truths. Unlike analytic a priori truths, things that are necessarily true, but don't really tell us anything about the world besides trivial facts about how words are defined, like all bachelors are unmarried, synthetic a priori truths actually tell us something useful about the way the world is, thus making them synthetic, and yet we know they are necessarily true without the sense or without the help of sense experience, thus making them a priori. Kant actually thought that mathematical and geometric truths fit into this category. The Pythagorean theorem tells us about the world, about all right triangles, and yet we can discover that it is true without actually having to go out and examine a bunch of triangles. Kant thinks that we can solve the problems involving causation and induction that Hume raises by realizing that all events have a cause is also a synthetic a priori truth. Something about the world that we can know is necessarily true without the use of sense experience. If, knowledge, if so, knowledge of causation would seem to be possible after all, and thus we can avoid Hume's skeptical problem and, in fact, find a ground for all scientific knowledge. Of course, that raises the issue of telling which proposed synthetic a priori statements actually are true and which are not. And modern science may have cast out on even Kant's suggestion. Quantum mechanics has revealed that Kant's statement, all events have a cause, is actually false. Things happen without a cause on the quantum level. Now, maybe we could change our rule to all events in the realm of medium-sized objects have a cause, but 
A, it's not clear that that's true either since the effects of quantum events might be observable on that level. And B, this doesn't seem to be a synthetic a priori truth, a truth discovered without the help of sense experience, given that science helped us conclude that it is true. But Kant raised his own skeptical problem when he recognized a distinction between what he called the phenomena and the noumena. The noumenal world is the world as it actually is, independent of our perception of it. The phenomenal world is the world as it is perceived by our senses. We can know the phenomenal world quite well, Kant says, but we can never know the noumenal world. We can never know the way the world actually is independent of our senses. In a way, we look at the noumenal world through rose-colored glasses, or we might say category-colored glasses, built into our senses and the way our brain processes them, Kant says, are categories. And everything we experience is placed into one of those categories of perception. There's categories of quantity, unity, plurality, totality. Categories of quality, reality, negation, limitation. Categories of relation, inherence, subsistence, cause and effect, and community. And categories of modality, possibility and impossibility, existence and non-existence, necessity and contingence. Our perception of the world through these categories makes the world seem a certain way to us, but it's not like it actually is that way. In the same way that rose-colored glasses make things seem rosy when they're not, our category glasses make the world seem to have quantity and quality and relation and modality when in fact it does not. How the world really is will forever be beyond our grasp, Kant says. Now, there have been various responses to Kant over the years. I think one is quite telling. And given some of the examples we've used, it might be obvious. Throughout this lecture, to show that our experience does not match up to the way the world is, I've given examples of ideas of, or perceptions that don't reflect the way the world is. For example, we know that our idea of heat doesn't match up with what causes it, the excitement of molecules. We know our perception of solidity does not match up with the fact that material objects are mostly empty space. We might even say that quantum mechanics proves Kant's point about how our categories force us to see the world in a way other than it actually is. Even though I know that all matter is fundamentally a wave function, and that particles can have both a cannot have both a precise position and momentum at the same time, I'll never be able to perceive the world in that way, or really even fully understand what that means. But wait a minute. If we can know the world only through experience, and our experience doesn't reveal how the world really is, then how do we know that heat is the excitement of molecules, that solid objects are mostly empty space, and that matter is quantum wave function weirdness? We know these things through science. And the strength of science lies in the fact that it appreciates and even is motivated by something agreed upon by rationalists, empir empiricists, and Kantians alike, that our experiences are inaccurate, that they can easily be led and lead us astray. They can generate erroneous conclusions. They can make the world appear in a way different than it actually is. Our senses and our experiences they produce are far from perfect. So the mere fact that you experience the world a certain way is not enough to establish that the world actually is that way, nor is the fact that many people have experienced that way. But the method of science itself is structured to guard against such shortcomings. In order for a theory about the way the world is to be acceptable, it not only has to make correct observable predictions, but it also has to provide the most wide-scoping, simple, conservative explanation. Of course, a theory could be wrong, and if it is, we couldn't rightfully claim it as knowledge. But if it is true, and it does provide the best explanation in this way, we could rightly claim to have knowledge, for it would be justified true belief, a belief beyond a reasonable doubt. 
And by taking this approach, science can actually tell us the way the world actually is. We'll never be able to perceive the world as it actually is. Our senses by themselves are just too limited. But we can come to know the way the world actually is by accepting the most adequate hypothesis about its nature. So, we can now offer at least a limited answer to the question of this lecture. How can we best acquire knowledge? If we're simply looking for knowledge of the phenomenal world, the world of our experience, then most of the time our experience will do. And that is useful knowledge to have, given that we primarily live in the phenomenal world. But we still need to realize that our perceptions can lead us astray, and we never want to fool ourselves into thinking that experience represents the way the world actually is. For the most accurate knowledge of the way the world is, we need to rely on science, aka natural philosophy. It's worth noting that by rejecting Descartes' idea that knowledge requires certainty, and by embracing the idea that knowledge of the world can be acquired through inference to the best explanation, we are almost directly in line with the pragmatist, especially John Dewey, who thought much of our knowledge was derived in this way. But of course, as we've discussed before, knowledge of the world is not the only kind of knowledge we're concerned with. We want moral knowledge and religious knowledge and metaphysical knowledge too. And for that, science can't do much. We'll have to continue to do some philosophy. But there's one more challenge to the possibility of knowledge that we need to consider first. This entire lecture, I've been asking whether we can have a justified true belief about the way the world is. And I've been couching this in terms of whether we can have knowledge of the way the world is. And that's because, as I've been for a few lectures now, I'm assuming that knowledge is justified true belief. But there are some who challenge that idea. And it is to that challenge that we shall turn next lecture.